you guys. Welcome back to Wild Speculations. I'm Daniel. I'm Scott. This week we talk about Critical Role Campaign 2, Episode 70, Cosatum, or The Cause, essentially. Uh, as that was for the effect, actually. Yeah. Uh, they uh, were debating whether or not they were the cause of everything. Um, I think that's why it's named that. Yeah. Um, yeah, quite a bit. Um, I have to give Sam props for the Foley. Okay. Um, I actually enjoyed that part because it's not often you see uh, the lost art. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Outside of a special stage. Um, I have to give Talus an MVP for this episode. I think so. Um, and I thought about waiting until the end of our discussion to talk about MVP or the middle or like when. And I think I, I decided to mention it right off the bat because um, right off the bat he was. Uh, Instrumental in everything. Um, right. But we were wrong. We said they would go north, and even though Taliesin wanted, yeah, to go north, they ended up going south because Matt very cleverly pointed them in a the southerly direction. Yeah. And foreshadowed uh, more southerly adventures to come. But, uh, alas, I don't think he's going to get those either. But, top it out when we come to it. Yeah. Um, so, the first thing they do is identify the dagger. It's plus two and you shove it in a keyhole and the door remains sealed and can't be unlocked until the dagger's been shoved in again. Yep. Uh, Which, considering that they know that Yasha and the Laughing Hand are out, means they don't have to worry, worry about it. if they should use it or not. Yeah. Um, so that's a handy little tool. Yeah. And you saw Bo kind of thinking about wanting it, you know, and asking, no, oh, is, is it finesse? I can use my dex. And, you know, not only can she use her dex, but it's a simple weapon, and therefore a merely simple weapon is a monk weapon. She can also use her martial arts damage with well, it. Well, specific weapons are monk weapons. Daggers are a part of that. Yes, daggers are a part of that. So she can use her martial arts die. Yeah, it's simple melee weapons and short swords. Uh, but yeah, um, but she didn't, she didn't, uh, take it. She let not have it. Yep. Um, so now it's up to four daggers. That are never used. I was going to say, yeah, and yes, because she, and the other three that she has, she also took as loot, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or they didn't they give one to Kiri? Isn't one of them that they got that Kiri took? But she still had those? three, okay. because she she made the comment that she feels like a rogue now because she has three daggers, oh. making a meta joke at Dax. Yeah. Um, but now she's got four. Yeah. And end game, I think Vax had five or six, so she's almost there. Yeah. Um, they, they're convinced that Yasha's coming, the Laughing Hand is coming. Yes. Um, and the first part of the episode is predicated on that mistaken belief. Yeah, because, uh, you know, even for, you know, Ford's like, hopefully the track's washed away, and, and just like, uh, she was here with us, she knows where to find us. <laughs> she knows exactly where to find us. He's like, 
And I love that he's like, okay, I'm going to go down, and if, if you hear a bunch of Eldritch Blasts, that's the signal. It's like, so when I attack, that's the signal that shit went wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the single best line of the episode was Taliesin's. Yeah. And he's like, look, I don't mean to raise my voice. <laughs> and everyone's like, wait, what? So good. <laughs> uh, but in their debate about, you know, do we listen to the Bright Do we tell the Bright Queen? Okay, we've told the Bright Queen. Do we tell her where we are? Do we be honest with her? And then she's given us orders. Do we follow those orders? All right. Um, that whole discussion that took up 40 minutes of the episode, really? Um, Taliesin uh, explains, exposes uh, why uh, religious people uh, prefer authoritarian rulers. Yeah. Because he says, you know, well, we can, I follow a higher perspective. And we're just looking to follow a mortal higher perspective than ours. Um, so uh, that was, and I didn't really like during the episode. I was like, oh yeah, that's you know that was a good line. Mm -hmm. I thought, but that I didn't appreciate it. And the weight of it until my rewatch. Yeah. Um, and it's like, yeah, that's that's it. Um, now, Travis Ford has was putting forward the argument uh, this episode and on talks last week. Yep. That you know they are responsible. For letting the laughing hand out. Yeah. It's his belief that if they would not have opened that door, they the laughing hand would not have gotten out. And we discussed this mm -hmm. last week as well. Um, and I think largely he has a point. He has a point, but to echo Jester's comment, you know, I mean... Oban could have done it. Could he? Why not? Because he didn't. Right, because he didn't want to waste resources. Let them waste the resources getting through the traps. Matt even said that he was there and he was letting them use up resources. Yeah. I, there's, uh, there's as much reason to believe he could as there is that he couldn't. Yeah, and I guess that's the hang-up for everybody. And and that's where you've got to look. I mean, is it? Did they make it easier? Did they make it possibly a quicker release? Yes, definitely. Would it have not happened if they hadn't gone in there? Yes, probably. Possibly. In the fullness of time, yes, probably. There or so there's two key I'm parts thinking of that. Maybe a couple of days difference here. Well, I mean, a day, two days, a week, a month. I mean, in in the scheme of things, yeah, that doesn't. But there are two key parts that were that kept that door sealed. One of them was the music key, the musical key. Mm -hmm. It is very possible Oban never bothered to touch the statues, never bothered to listen to them, and so did not know the tomb. The other thing is that dagger. Right. That dagger was in a mirror dimension to prevent fiends from getting it. That's why I say it's very possible Oban could not have yeah. opened that door. Because otherwise he would have, because he opened every single door. 
between the front door and that one. Yeah. That that is an argument, but um, now I think f he feels exceptionally guilty because I think his plan was: Are there tracks? No. Close the door. But yeah. he rolled so badly that he didn't he couldn't determine. So he's like, well, I guess, and everyone wanted to go in and see. Yeah. So they go in and see. And, well, I think Ford feels takes is taking the guilt mainly because right now he's probably thinking, "Is this my lot in life, just to release horrors between Ukatoa and now his part, their part in the Laughing Hand?" Um, I mean, I would answer that question. Yes. Yeah, I, I think that's part of why. Um, you know, I mean. And you got to think, so he's going to feel more guilty about it than the rest of the party. So we've talked about potential connections with Campaign 1 mm -hmm. and Art again being the Traveler. And now there's it's possible that Vecna's tampering with Godhood and being sent across the Divine Gate has made it so that these defenses that uh, Morden and Melora and Saloon, mm -hmm. uh, that all these gods and goddesses apparently built into these evil places, because uh, they you know built the temples for these beings apparently. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible that. Those need to be reset. Yeah. And for them to be reset, these things have to be released. Um, or for the Laughing Hand to be banished permanently. Yeah. Um, and maybe that's why Caduceus had this vision and why his family did important. And it's possible that the other, uh, was it stone? Stone and dust. Uh, and dust went to the volcano. And stone went south. Yeah. I didn't to think about it. That could be where the, near or exactly where Ukotoa needed to be released from. Yeah. Um, at least that that was my thought on the rewatch, you know, because I was I was trying to think in the grand in the overarching grand scheme of things, what does Caduceus's story tell us about these things? But uh, yeah, um, they message the Bright Queen. Yep. Uh, who basically sums up her response, one sentence response, you know, if you sum it up is, don't tell anybody, come back. Yeah. Um, which Ford seems to have a problem with. Um, which I think... Part of me is kind of disappointed that they didn't uh, disobey the Bright Queen and tell people. Um, I think well, there was evidence that she sent some kind of word because there was more guards. Yes, but they didn't know that when they were debating whether or not to yeah. follow her orders or not. That's true. Uh, they were proceeding under the assumption that she would not tell anyone here. Yeah. Um, that she didn't know who to trust. Right. Um, which has me thinking again, they, Matt has never done the blood war. No. In 
in, the, in campaign one or campaign two. And I am expecting that to come into play this campaign. Um, I, I think we've seen hints of it. We've talked about the hints of it. Yeah. Uh, especially with uh, Baphomet's name being dropped this episode. Yeah. And Baphomet being paired with the Crawling King. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I, I think they made the right call, though. Like, I, I agree with the consensus of the group. With Clay's, you know, we, we haven't done anything. We're... You know, we've decided to foster trust. You know, yeah. this is the this is the time that honesty is of value. You know. Yeah. Well, I don't. Yeah, I don't think what they did was uh, strategically incorrect at all. Um, I think it was the right move. Uh, it's just the 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 debate is interesting. Yeah, I think. Um, and Jester scries on Yasha. Mm -hmm. That felt very much like the first time we see Darth Vader. Uh, or, sorry, the Emperor. Mm. Uh, in episode 5. Okay. Where Yasha is essentially Darth Vader kneeling before the hologram, the light. Yeah. Uh, and I enjoyed that. Uh, and Jester fears that she's always been evil. And you could certainly argue that that's the case. Because she's a fallen ASMR. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, and Ford is of that belief. Yeah. And he made that clear and you know, as they say, it takes one to know one. <laughs> Sorry, had to throw my jab at four. Well, and I was going to... Arguably, he has been acting more good than evil the past few episodes. Yes. Especially with the wanting to warn people. and But not lawful. No, no, not lawful at all. Uh, and that was the observation that I was going to make and give you the opening. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, the man makes a habit of not being who he says he is. It's true. <laughs> yeah. That's very true. Uh, and Jester is super disappointed in the Mighty Nine. Um, the, the debate over their guilt or innocence, the debate about obeying the Bright Queen or straight up ignoring her, disobeying her. Mm -hmm. um, Yasha's betrayal. I think it's really weighing heavily on her. And we saw hints of it at the beginning of the episode, and then almost uh, a definite conclusion at the end where she says to the traveler, she's lamenting to the traveler, you know, at you know, the world's full of pain and misery. Yeah. You know, I thought it was going to be amazing. Yeah, and there are parts that are, but it's mostly pain and misery. Yeah. And I think this is Jester's first steps at growing up. When you realize it's not, you know, not to put a dark spin on life, yeah. but, you know, um, she's never dealt with loss like this. Oh, Molly. Right, but, I mean, she wasn't there for Molly. I mean, she, she was, but she wasn't. That's true. You know, she, she didn't witness it. She, she found out about it after the fact. Yeah. And that did hit her, and that did, in a sense, start this. You know, we've seen some underscored changes. 
But this is where she was right there. She watched it happen. She tried to save her, and there was absolutely nothing that she could do. Yeah. And she's never had that before. You know. And we also see more evidence. Uh, that's not a good word. Of But her trial of fate. Mm-hmm. Um, that she's afraid that the traveler isn't going to be there. Can you imagine what would happen if she knew that Ukatoa took Ford's powers? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was... It's interesting to see, and, and I think maybe they talked about this, um, but the different... Uh, the different journeys of faith that the clerics are on. Yeah. Where Caduceus is very strong in his faith and I don't want to say it's blind faith but it's when he interprets something as uh a, a hint from the uh, Wild Mother uh, when he thinks that the path that he is on is destiny. Mm -hmm. He accepts that blindly and yeah. fully. Um, to the point that he did some questionable stuff or was involved tangentially with some questionable yeah. stuff. And he basically was telling himself it's it's all in service to the Wild Mother. It's what she needs me to do, right. so I'll do it. Um, so, yeah. Um, but while we were totally wrong on them going north and on them reaching level 10 that, uh, yeah. in episode 70, uh, we got a big... We were right in this episode mm -hmm. when Caduceus cast Legend Lore. Yes. And we learned that the sword is named uh, Dwethvar. Yes, the Star Razor. And I thought it was razor, like razor, like cutting razor. Uh, on Critical Recap, they spelled it razor, like raised from the dead. I'm assuming she checks with Matt on that. Yeah, you know and that 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 is the correct. Um, but the interesting thing, you know. Yeah, it's, you know, most definitely a vestige at this point. The interesting thing is most vestiges are created by one god. This is the partnership of acolytes of two gods, the Wild Mother and the Moon Weaver, which are Taliesin's two characters' gods in yes. this campaign. Yes. Um, quote, Molly's story isn't done, end quote. <laughs> So, yeah, um, I thought that was really interesting, and it also uh, means we could be wrong about Ford multiclassing. This weapon could be the key to keeping him just a straight hex blade, but different patron. Yeah. Um. Instead of the sort of fathoms he carries the sun, the star razor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, do we want to speculate on the powers of this vestige? Uh, because I have some ideas. Okay, what are your ideas? Um, it says that it has the powers of the moon, of the full moon. Yes. Um, so I think it's going to have properties of the Moonblade, which is a common magic item. Okay. I think that'll be sort of the baseline power level. I think it will allow him to cast Moonbeam. Okay. Uh, and I have a feeling it's also going to do extra things to Shape Changers. Mm. Um, and see, my thought... 
I'm pretty much in line with you, but instead of do extra things to shape changers, I was wondering if maybe it doesn't give him the ability to shift like the order of the lichen. Allow him to channel that power of the moon through him. Only reason I thought that is I know how much Travis loves werewolves and that could be a nice gift to him. Yeah, but I think this magic item was designed for Molly. Hmm. Uh, so I I don't think it's going to have any okay. anything like that. Um, uh, yeah, I think when Matt was planning the campaign uh, and planned this magic item, because uh, vestiges are big deals yes. in his campaign. Very big deals. Um, this was done early. Yeah. Um, so I think it was definitely designed for Molly. Okay. Um, and interesting note succubi and incubi are fiends and shape shifters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, see, it's a good point, but I, you know, part of me wonders is, because it's made, was it always made by the two? Or was Melora added after Molly died? And was it made to give to Ford as a way out of service to Ukatoa? No, I don't think so. I think Matt was was probably planning on having Travis be in service to Ukatoa the whole time. Okay. Uh, as we talked about very, you know, many many episodes ago, uh, the the warlock resisting their patron is a trope. Huge. It's a trope mm -hmm. because it's huge story fodder. Yeah, there's a lot in there that you can do, um, and you know, as when we, the the patron can't totally remove mm -hmm. the warlock's power, um, but we've seen that Matt's perfectly comfortable uh, giving a temporary loss of power. Yep. Uh, the the Turning it off and turning it back on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the reboot cycle. Um, so yeah, I, the fact that it was reforged by Uthodurians, the dwarves and the elves, mm -hmm. um, I think maybe where. There's a clue there, and I we don't have enough information. Um, but I think it has to do with those flying cities, uh, yeah. pre-divergence. Um, I will see if we ever get to that. If that's just something Matt uh, just sort of threw in as a throwaway thing, um, but. Uh, Jester messages Shikasta, mm -hmm. and we get confirmation that Luke is in Nicodranas. Yep, Luke and Edith are saved, uh, which is another breadcrumb that Matt placed for them to go south. Yeah, to get Yezza there, reunite them, and because he was planning on TravelerCon being. Off the coast. Yeah. So he's putting all these things to send them south. And, uh, yeah. Uh, Jester, with a natural 20, uh, seems to have convinced the traveler to go the syndrome route, to do the Bond villain yeah. thing and do the layer in the volcano. Yep. Yeah. Uh, 
This will have all kinds of implications because now she asked the traveler what was on that island and he said that he didn't know that he had never been there. I think that's a lie. Okay. I... Uh, and the fact that she gave another goddess his place of power as a location for his miracle feeds into the fact that that was probably a lie. Yeah. Um, and that he was like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. You know, I, I, I don't... I'm at a point where I don't believe anything the Traveler says is it probably equal parts lie in truth. I mean, maybe he knows what's there, but he's never been... He honestly has never been there. Yeah. That he... He, he's heard tale of something. Yeah. Um, not tries to play matchmaker again. Yeah. This time between Jester and Shikasta. Yes. Uh, I was trying to think why not does that. Why do you think not does that. Or do you think it's just Sam? I was going to say, that, so that Sam can <laughs> fuck with people? It's <laughs> fair. I, I think that's as valid as an answer as any. I think it's at least partially that. You know? Just like there's truth and lie in everything Artigan says. There's Sam and not in whatever not is doing. Yeah. Uh, and see, um, I was I was gonna go the storybook route and say that uh, that not is just a hopeless romantic, and her happiness is Yeza and Luke, and she wants Jester to be to find that happiness. Well, I think that's a very valid argument. I think that. There's probably part of that, you know. Um, but also to troll the shippers. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one thing that Sam and Travis have in common. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, the... The fact that TravelerCon isn't going south means uh, no Orly. Does it? Yeah. Are, are, are you saying that and that you think that it has to be in the south to see Orly just because he's in the south? Or do you think he's a follower of the Traveler too? No, just because he's in the south. Okay. Um, although, uh, at the beginning of this episode, when they were interrogating Matt about that village at the far north, the furthest north village that they have on that map, mm -hmm. uh, which was the goblin and orc fishing conglomerate, uh, I immediately thought, I was like, they could message Orly and have him sail there. Yeah. Um, it would be a long journey, but he could do it if they needed him to, for whatever reason. Yeah. Um, which and is. Yeah. Give him a way back without going through all the crap of the Empire and the. or. Shorhoss. Yes. Um, and without using a spell slot. Right. Uh,. But that was before Matt revealed, yeah, there's an island off, you know, down there that Travel wanted to go to. So it was like, like immediately I was like, oh, so it was bring Orly in and uh, basically have uh, Jester cruise lines 
and basically have Orly ferrying all of the traveling worshippers to the island for the whatever it was going to be. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I'm just kind of saddened that of all the the lost possibilities because I was still hoping to have some Kuatoa involved in the Traveler's Ascension. Um, and that would have been possible if they went to the island, but not so much in the a volcano. volcano. Yeah. Uh, but we also got confirmation this episode that the Traveler is not a god. Yeah. Uh, super subtle, but it was there. Because Jester asked him, do you talk to the other gods? He's like, there's no real communication. It's because he's on the wrong side of the divine gate. Mm -hmm. uh, and well, I mean, technically he's an archfey and not a... <laughs> yeah. Uh, but they get back to Rosanna. They teleport back after the ham-fisted way that they tried to warn people and check on the defenses. Mm -hmm. uh, I really do think Matt having it be an ogre was his way to save Ford from himself. Mm -hmm. Because if it had been a drow or a hobgoblin who would remember and like, who are you? Someone who might question him, yeah, uh, or remember details that would expose them. Uh, yeah, uh, th that was Matt being kind. Uh, yeah, um, but they get back. They meet with the Bright Queen, and the good news she had for them is, congrats and thank you. Your information killed many. Empire's Empire citizens. Yep. Uh, and they tell him that they've captured a scourger. Mm -hmm. And Caleb asks to speak with the scourger. But before we get to that, there was something else that I wanted to mention in that meeting. Okay. I don't think the Bright Queen knew that Essek taught Caleb Dunamancy. And I don't think she approves. I don't think she approves, but... She may not know, but she at least had a suspicion. Well, and Caleb all... Well, because Essek mentioned that... Called one them student. Yes. And she gave the sideways look. So she at least had an idea if she didn't full out no. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I think that's an interesting uh, foreshadowing because I think Essex loyalties are going to prove to be important. Yeah. Uh, and we talked about him potentially being a warlock. Mm hmm. And. If he's a fiend pact, yeah, that could be the devil side of the equation in Jorhas. That's true. Um, so, yeah. Um, also, I. It's too. I don't know, too Judeo Christian. Uh, but when I was thinking about this episode and the celestial, the angels and the demons, and that they're worried about that conflict, but I was thinking the it's potentially the blood war here. 
Yeah. Um, what if the Luxon is, uh, you know, what if the light is the light bringer? Yeah. Lucifer. A devil. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, it's probably not that. I don't think it will be that. Right. But it was just an interesting cul-de-sac my brain went down. Uh, plus, if it ends up being that, I can say, hey. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah. Um, but instead of cashing in for library access or more spells, Caleb asked to interview the scourger. Yes. And he is afraid that it is uh, Astrid. Astrid, yeah. And overplays his hand in talking with her. Um, well, some interesting knowledge gets dropped through that, though. Um, it's not Astrid, but it's someone who knows of Bren. Bren is someone who has talked about among the Scourgers. So, this shadow organization, whatever you want to call it, is admittedly by both Liam and Matt set up to be a uh, fantasy KGB style. Yeah. Uh -uh. We know that Trent is an enchanter. Yes. We know that he fucks with people's minds. We know that he's really good at it because he's an enchanter. Fantasy KGB would not leave loose ends. Okay. Caleb, what we know of Caleb's departure, not that I think he's been dishonest, but I don't think we've got the whole truth, and I don't think he has the whole truth at this point. What if, just okay. hear me out, okay. His time in the asylum is muddled. Okay. If they... and the, Okay, I'm assuming that they didn't just take him for Ted while he was in the asylum. Okay. Okay. What if he was a Winter Soldier type? And it's not just a cautionary tale, but he was pulled out of the asylum when he was needed. His mind fucked with him. He was kept in there as a holding thing until his mind was healed by what we think is the celestial sorcerer. The sorcerer. Or, yeah, or uh, celestial pack warlock. Yeah. yeah. And he broke out and he doesn't remember. What if that's why they've heard of him? He's not just a cautionary tale, but he's done stuff. Because the way she looked at him, the way interesting to know, it doesn't seem like it was Oh, he's he's a guy that was out there and disappeared. No. Her so to comment on your theory about him being a winter soldier type mind programmed. No. Um if the scourgers are supposed to be KGB, Soviet Russian intelligence, uh, however you want to parse that. Um then what Caleb is, okay. is the uh, protagonist of 1984. Okay. Or he is one of the gentlemen that the protagonist witnesses and is able to recall what the party did to those men. The party doesn't have to kill people to make, to use them. Right. Uh, Caleb broke faith, and he went insane. And they kept him alive, and they told every single person that they could ever in the program, this is what happens when you go against the state. The state knows best. 
Okay. Uh, that's where I think she knows Bren from. But why it was important for her in that moment was because she would have already put together that they were betraying. So she's sitting there, or has been sitting there for however long she's been captive, trying to piece together who tipped off the dynasty of their mission. Mm -hmm. And here's this guy talking Zemnian at her and mentions a name that she recognizes. Right. And that's why she turned and said, you must know him. Are you him? Because, yeah, they would know him and they would probably know that he escaped. And if they didn't know that he escaped, they got a weird letter asking about Astrid because she inherited yeah. money. Okay. So, yeah, it's all that's going to cut is going to come down on them, I think. Um, and that comes into what I wanted to get into in the last, you know, 12 minutes or so that we've got. Well, do we want to touch on Caduceus' story first? I mean, there's a lot of exposition. We've talked yeah. about a little bit already this episode. Yeah. The, the, uh, the is there anything in particular you wanted to cover? Uh, I think the most interesting thing about that is that the three heroes that started those families were followers of the Raven Queen. They yeah. were tasked by the Raven Queen. And then she said, no, I've got what I need from this. You need to go seek out the Wild Mother. Um, I think that's the most interesting thing. And then all their descendants are followers of the Wild Mother. Well, I think that plays more into this is like with the this vestige that's two gods rather mm -hmm. than the one from last campaign. Right. Um, and the fact that there is overlap between the Wild Mother and the Matron of Ravens mm -hmm. uh, in that they both abhor undead. Right. Uh, so where there is overlap, I think Matt's playing in that space. Okay. Um, with them. Uh, because I also noticed that each of the three, what they did was to remind a different god. Yes. About nature. Yes. Uh, and also interesting is... And it's because Taliesin knows his stuff. Um, they cover the three ways that humans dispose of their bodies. Yeah. Burial, cremation, and uh, sky burials. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I, I thought that was interesting. Um, but, yeah. So... After they get back and they chat, they send to Dyron. Caleb has a chat with Bo, mm -hmm. where Bo basically uh, says, "Yeah, me and Ford are still in charge of the Mighty Nine. She didn't say that. Yeah, but the tone of the conversation, the direction of it, everything that had come before in this episode, talking about authority. And she put her and Ford as the people that should be argued with in the group because they are the authority. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I, th I think Caleb might have been right that Yasha's betrayal is going to fracture them. Mm -hmm. um, and the first chip is going to be Veth not staying or going when they get to Nicodranas. I think that, well, okay. Not the first crack. That will be the first step toward healing if she decides to stay. And I think she's going to. I do too. And here's 
Here's my thought, and I know I've talked about is she gonna, you know, go ahead and go. Yes, Yeza has accepted her. Yes, Yeza still loves her, even though you know, even the way she is. I don't know that Luke will. Yeah. Kids are very adaptable, but this is a kid who was taken captive by these things with his parents, mm -hmm. who has been told that his mother God was killed, killed yeah. and now his mom is one. Yeah, I, I think she's going to have to become a halfling for him. Yeah, and so she's going to stay with the nine until she can do that. Yeah, and uh. That is a good point, but that is not why I was saying she was going to be with them. Okay. Uh, I think she took Yeza's comments to heart when he's like, I'm in the wrong line of work. Uh, you're making a lot of money doing this adventuring thing. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that's going to reconcile her to go out with them. And I think where not has been on the lower side of the money-grubbing rogue. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to increase? I think so. Okay. Where not has benefited from. And every now and then you can see it in Sam's smiles when they are out and paying for shit. Mm-hmm. Everyone always buys not stuff. She almost never has to buy anything. Although she was willing to pay. Yeah. And that was a big thing to <laughs> this episode. Oh, I'm sorry. I just assumed. Which is odd because she doesn't steal gear. No. She's never stolen gear from vendors or anything. Only thing she's stolen was the flask. Yeah. As far as gear... Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. It was a little odd. Um, but yeah. Uh, but Dyron, mm -hmm. last few minutes, because this is going to dictate most of my speculations for this coming episode. Whew. Dyron comes. Mm -hmm. And. Marisha's super afraid. She's like, I'm in trouble. I could tell by the way she asked for me. Well, Dyron, she's probably heard the rumors of these humans. Maybe. But I think it's... Bo did not make contact with her in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. As she was supposed to. But... Dyron will have known about the attacks that were foiled. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I have a feeling that Dyron is going to possibly beat it out of her. Oh yeah. No, that's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's because we know she's been disguising it as a drow. We know she's a good spy. We know she gets information. She's this town has probably got some rumors about the humans that are in the and they're not hiding what they look and, like. And the fact and that the description of Bo as a champion of the Bright Queen mm -hmm. has probably gotten to her in this time. Yep, and she knows that they're flashy and they're living in this. Freaking Adam's family house, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think her first instinct is going to be to beat it out of her because of that. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't think she's... If she gives her the opportunity to come clean, it's only going to be a half-hearted one hoping that she lies. falters even the little spit to give her the excuse to beat it out of her. Yeah. Um, and I'm expecting her to beat it out of her jester... And anyone else that tries to step in, oh yeah, and she's going to be spending key points for that truth ability, mm -hmm. and you're going to tell me. Yep. And she's going to ask pointed questions 
that are yes no answers that she, they will either have to say the truth or not answer which gives her the answer that she needs yep uh, and it is not going to be good um, because Dyron proved in their last encounter with her that she is super pro empire and super anti dynasty yep um, and it is not going to be pretty um, no it is not so here's my question the big what if okay Dyron confronts them gets it out of them beats down them, whatever and in that Either she knows beforehand, or she finds out in that confrontation that the dynasty is keeping a scourger. Yeah. And she says, I need them. And if you don't want me to do X, Y, Z to you, kill you, expel you, expose tell, you, expo yeah, uh, you're going to help me get her out. Yeah. Does Caleb sell them out? Yeah. You think so? Caleb is not going to be okay letting a Scourger go. Or do you think... That's that's the part of the Emperor he's trying to get rid of. Yeah. He's not going to help them succeed. Well, and that's why, like, Dyron having her... Like, maybe she can spin it to Caleb. Look, this person has information that I need to expose the corruption that I'm looking for. Right? Because that's how Caleb's going to spend her leaving the Scourger with the dynasty. Mm -hmm. But Dyron's going to want her for her access to the top where Caleb is saying that all this stuff's coming from. So there's a lot of reasons for Dyron to want that Scourger yeah. out of the dynasty's custody. Or do they let the execution take place? But Dyron makes them raise her from the dead. Because that's another possibility. I think if they if they do do it, that's how they're going to do it. Okay. And or Caleb the, says that is the safest way to do it and not end up on the bad side of the bright queen. True. Or does Caleb say, look, I have access to her. Give me your list of questions. I'll ask that's them. what. Uh, that's the most likely. That, okay. Yeah. As the peaceable way. Or disguise yourself as Bo and will go into questioner. So you can ask the questions. Because she's got the elder self, which you can't mm. disguise as someone else. Yeah. So. Because, yeah, because Dyron's not going to let Bo do it. I don't no. think. Not at this but point. If that deal, if that deal is floating, I think Dyron takes that deal. Yeah. And stops the beatings. Uh, and then, then you have the two most likely to betray the other going in to talk to the scourger together. Yeah, yeah. Um, level ten this week. I'm thinking. I mean, yeah. I me mean, too. I, I was expecting it. This last episode, it didn't happen. They. I mean. Well, and Matt said that this episode. Episode 70 was a check-in episode. Yeah. And looking back, that's sort of been when the level has happened. Yeah. When they've had a chance to digest the things that have just happened. To what them. they've learned, yeah. Yeah. So it might happen this week. Cause I'm, I'm guessing it's going to happen this week. I don't know if it's going to be beginning or end yeah. either. Because it could arguably yeah. be either. Yeah. Arguably it could be a break. Okay, it depends. They have done that before. It depends on what they accomplish pre brain. How the confrontation with Dyron goes. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, well, it's MVP uh, Taliesin. Yes. And Liam on um, talks tonight. So we're going to go and enjoy that. And we will see you guys next week. Bye, guys.